Hello there, my name is Steve Weaver and my wife Karen and I are the lead pastors of New Life Church in Cypress, Texas. We've had the privilege of pastoring New Life since March 26, 1989. So this coming March will be 34 years. It's been a wonderful journey. It's been an interesting journey. And I've learned a few things about longevity in ministry having been here really for over half of my life. And I want to just share four things with you that I believe will be helpful in, in having longevity in ministry. The first thing that I think is vital for having longevity in ministry or staying the course, if you please, is to establish proper priorities early on. Establish the proper priorities early on. I have a personal priority list. This is Steve Weaver and not Jesus speaking, but I believe it's been helpful to me to establish tenure in our ministry here at New Life. And that priority list is this. I prioritize God first, family second, and ministry third. Now, I have to quickly say that prioritizing God does not equal prioritizing my vocational ministry because those are two different things. Let me tell you what happened early on in ministry. We were just starting our journey out in our present location. We had relocated, rebranded the name for the church and started fresh in Cyprus, Texas, and a family that came. Oh, they were so excited about being a part. And they heard that I was relocating a house to some property that we owned out in Brookshire. And one day, my son Jordan and I had gone out to burn some rubbish. And after we had burned this rubbish on the property, I had told him we were going to play pitch. Well, we got there and we started the fire and it was burning and we walked to the front of the property and right as we got there with about an hour of daylight left, this couple pulls onto the property and they got out and come up and started talking to me about the church and excitement about working for the Lord and sharing all of these different ideas. And all the while, my son Jordan stood over at the side tossing the ball up in the air and catching it with his glove. And it got later and later, and they talked longer and longer until all daylight was gone. And there stood my son with his ball and his glove, and that moment was gone forever. I'm telling you, friends, it did something in my heart that to this moment impacts me. It made me to realize that as important as people are, the number one priority, first of all, in my relationship with God is that personal relationship with him. But secondly, my family is the second priority because people will come and go in ministry. I know we don't like to think that, but they will. They will decide that the season has changed, that they're not being fed, or that God's calling them to a new season of ministry elsewhere, and they'll wave by and be gone. And who'll be left? Your family will always be there. So I established early on, if my son's playing basketball on a Tuesday night, I'm going to be at that game. If my daughters are cheering on Friday night or Tuesday and Thursday nights, I'm going to be at those games. Wherever my family is, I'm going to prioritize them. I was at church when we had church services, but friends, I had to make a decision that I was going to have a priority succession in my life and I was going to follow it. And early on, I decided it's going to be God first, family second, and ministry third. And God has blessed me with that priority to this day. Our oldest daughter, Brooke, and her husband pastor our daughter church, Harvest Family Church. 
My middle child, our son Jordan and his wife Sydney, they're on staff with us as co-pastors at New Life Church and now taking the primary lead as he pastors the church and I pastor our long transition of leadership. And our youngest child, Caitlin, and her husband Jared, she's on staff at the Oaks in Red Oak, Texas. And Jared is on staff and faculty at Southwestern Assemblies of God University as a teacher and as a football coach. Friends, I didn't lose my family. You know, I've got a, a, a saying that's, that's my saying and others have said it, I'm sure. But if I gain the whole world and lose my own family, friends, that's, uh, that, that's going to be a huge loss. And I don't want to see that happen. And I, thank God, I haven't seen that happen. And you don't have to either. Number one, prioritize your life properly early on. Make that decision. God first, family second, and ministry third. Live by it, and it'll bear fruits. Secondly, I want to share this with you. Avoid the comparison trap. Avoid that trap. Did you know that Matthew 25 tells us that Jesus handed out talents and he gave some five, some two, and some one. There's always going to be five talent people. There's always going to be two talent people. And there'll always be one talent people. I don't know where I fall in that. You know, I know I'm somewhere between zero and five in there somewhere. I don't know if there's percentage or decimals, but whatever the case may be, there's always going to be leaders that have great talent, that are greater leaders. But did you know the Bible tells us that the same criteria for judging them is going to be used to judge me. When we stand before the Lord and we lay out what we've done, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I make you ruler over many. He didn't ask you to be the greatest. He just asked you to be faithful. So you work hard and be faithful to that assignment. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 10 when Paul was talking about his authority in, as an apostle. And he made a statement to them. He said that if you use the standard of measurement being people's accomplishments as your standard of measurement and you compare yourself to someone else's standard of, of measurement, he said that's unwise. When you compare yourselves among yourselves, it's unwise. In other words, people's accomplishments, other people's ministries, how successful they are, how well known they are in the assemblies of God or whatever fellowship you're a part of. Let me tell you, whatever other accomplishments people have, that should never be the standard of measurement for your life. John reminds us in the Gospel of John 3.27, that no one has anything that God hasn't given them. So friends, you're almost judging yourself or measuring yourself or comparing yourself to some phantom something that really doesn't exist because people only have what God entrusts to them. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6, only God can cause anything to be fruitful. He said, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, or Apollos planted, and I watered. But God gave the increase. We can't make anything grow. So just do your best. Don't compare. Decide now you're going to avoid the comparison trap. And friends, you just work hard for God in that place of assignment. A third thing. You need to maintain a daily spiritual relationship with the Lord. In other words, friends, to last long anywhere, you're going to have to have a daily spiritual diet, a personal relationship every day with the Lord. It's a non-negotiable. I call it a daily devotional habit of prayer and the Word. Take time every day. I think every minister ought to start their day with a time in prayer and the word as a non-negotiable. It's Jesus found it necessary to pray early and to pray daily. 
And then he told us in the disciples' prayer that we should pray and say, give us today our daily bread. Then the presumption on the part of Jesus is that his followers are praying every day. And my goodness, we want our congregations to pray. We want them to spend time with God every day. So surely we, as the leaders of our precious flocks, will be spending time early, spending time daily, and then getting into the Word. Not into the Word for sermon preparation. I'm talking about for devotional time. Remember, sermon preparation is not equal to devotional time with the Lord. They're two different things. And you need to be getting daily bread through prayer and the Word of God. Praying in the Spirit. Putting on the armor of God every day that you live. And then I like to get the promises of God. It tells me in Galatians chapter 3, 28, 29, that now that I'm in Christ, I'm the seed of Abraham. And every promise that God made to Abraham belongs to me. So every day, not only pray. Not only use that prayer protocol of the Lord's Prayer, but pray that armor of God over your life. And then declare the promises of God that are yours because you're the seed of Abraham. Friends, maintain that daily spiritual health with a daily devotional habit. I've done it now for almost 50 years of my life. The same thing. Every morning, the same place. Well, of course, I haven't lived the same place, but I mean the same time of day in the same place of my home. I have a chair and I have a place where I meet with God and daily I focus on that devotional habit. Friends, do that. And I believe God's going to help you to, to stay the course and to have longevity in ministry. And one last thing, let me just share this with you before I go. The fourth thing is this, add value to your assignment. In other words, don't look around at other assignments or think, if I could just be over there, I would be more successful. If I could only be ministering in another city, in another size church, in another locale, instead of being rural, if I was suburban or inner city, I'd be much more effective. Friends, add value where you're planted. I decided early on, if I can't do it at New Life, I can't do it anywhere. Now, I know there's exceptions to that, but that's the way I decided to think. I'm going to add value to my assignment. What I did to do that was I decided to focus on growing people and not growing a church. Second of all, I decided I was going to do what Charles Crabtree told us to do many years ago. He said when he pastored, I try every week to make something better in my church. Whatever it is, maybe the offering envelopes are straighter that Sunday, or the building's cleaner, or a wall is repainted. Just decide every week you're going to make something better. And lastly, I try to add value to my assignment by making succession the ultimate success. And that is, I want to be handing my assignment off to the next generation. For me personally, I'm blessed that I was able to, to release all three of my kids in ministry. And in particular, here at New Life, my son Jordan and his wife Sydney, they are now co-leading. And we're in the process of handing the baton of the leadership of the church to them. He is and will be the successor at New Life Church. And, but if I didn't have a son, I'd want to be, an, or a daughter that I could hand the baton to here at New Life. I'd be finding a spiritual son. I'd be focusing on succession. I wouldn't want to ride something to the ground. I wouldn't want to age out something with my ideologies and everything seen through the lens of my eyes. I'd want it to be through the eyes of the next generation so that making succession the ultimate victory and the ultimate success, we can hand the baton and in the end say, I've run the race, I've finished it, I've kept the faith, I fought a good fight. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Friends, 
You're going to, you're going to stay the course, but you got to decide early to make the right decisions. And I hope those four things will help you in staying the course, finishing strong. May God bless you. Bye now.